That's a lot to live up to. One correction, Scotty, as you walk up. Both of my daughters are out on missions, and I wish you were right, wrong on that one because I wish you were right on that one because I'd take one or both of them back in a second. They're both out. Jess is in Tallahassee, Florida. She comes home in February, praying she won't extend. Kate's in South Carolina. Oh, muchas gracias. Um, yeah, good to be with you guys today. Welcome to the Entrepreneur Lecture Series. I think this is one of the smartest and best classes, second to my own class, that you can take at BYU. To come in here and be inspired by entrepreneurs, to listen to what they have to say. Maybe some are humble, maybe some are arrogant. They have all different kinds of ideas. You learn from listening to them. And this is a great place to spend your time, especially if you want to be, if you have an inkling of becoming an entrepreneur. How many of you want to be an entrepreneur? Okay, good. How many of you do not want to be an entrepreneur? Come on, be brave. I like it, bravery. Why are you in here? Yeah. Thought it sounded interesting, okay. Please, who, who was it? Exploring your options, I totally respect that. Sir, behind her. You wanna work with a startup, trying to figure out what's going on inside? I like that, you stuff to figure out. Who else? Why are you in here? Okay, open up your options, a business minor. Over here, representing this side of the room, right there, why? Okay, so I'm gonna talk about entrepreneur interviews in a little bit, but I wanna jump on it right now. Yeah, one more? No, well, on a side note, I just texted someone who just got back from the Tallahassee Florida mission. Did they bring my daughter home? No, but she said she loves this Ah, that's nice. <laughs> I'm out, you guys take it from here. I'm wiped out. Thank you. Okay, my wife, she absorbed that too. So, so one of the assignments that I give my students every semester, I'm ENT 101. If you want to be an entrepreneur, you want to take my class. Monday and Wednesdays, 2 to 3.15. There's a shameless plug. I give them an assignment that's called an entrepreneur interview. And I ask them to do two entrepreneur interviews a semester. How many of my students are in here? Current or before? Okay, a few of you. Um, and what I ask them to do is go spend 20 to 30 minutes sitting down with an entrepreneur, asking them, why did you start your business? How did you get into it? What have been the pitfalls? What have been the successes? What have you enjoyed along the way? How's your spouse with this? What can you share with me that you'd like me to know that you wish I would have known when, when you were my age? And then for their report, I ask for one page and I just ask them to give me three to four takeaways. Don't tell me about the interview. I know you can record it and dictate it. I wanna know what you took away from that. The purpose of that interview is to, one, start your networking. Scott just told you about fusion. Every time you do an interview with somebody, formal or informal, you just started the networking process. You now have somebody who respects you and will help you as you begin your business. But to your point, the reason that I brought this up, and I won't talk about entrepreneur interviews later, so many people go into life as we do these entrepreneur interviews, and the feedback that we get, yeah, I didn't start my business until I was 45 years old. I was so tired of working in the drama and the bureaucracy of the workplace. I had to get out and do my own thing. And my only regret is, I didn't do it 20 years ago. So those of you who are in here who are not interested in owning your own business, but you're in the Entrepreneur Lecture Series, who knows what awaits you in life, okay? I respect you being here. Hopefully you'll take something away today helpful. Those of you who want to be entrepreneurs, why? Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? Just throw it out. Sir? Independence. Independence, I love it, okay? Whoa, way back there. Money. Money. Oh. Wow, you greedy, money-grubbing person. It's terrible. <laughs> Sir. I want to work in something I'm passionate about, and as an entrepreneur, I simply follow my passion. 
Okay, you get to choose, right? You're going to follow your passions. Great. Yes? Creatively solve problems. Creatively solve problems. Sir, yeah, ma'am. Flexibility and the ability to change, yes. It's exciting. it's exciting. I fly out of bed every morning. I love what I do. One of my students, I just met her outside class as I was coming back in to speak to you guys. And she was out there and she had a list of paper and she was so genuinely excited. That's my life. It's exciting. If you ask my wife, what's it like to be married? If you come upstairs, you could ask her. What's it like to be married to an entrepreneur? What's it like, honey? A total adventure. Every day is an adventure. She's an entrepreneur as well. But yeah, it is super exciting. Thank you. More. Why do you want to be an entrepreneur? I don't want to work for somebody. Every day, my class begins with that on the screen. OK? Just read that for a moment and digest it. It suggests. Yeah, go ahead, take pictures. It suggests that there are two choices in life. I can build my own wealth, or I can build somebody else's. I can build my own dream, or I can build somebody else's. Now, it's interesting in these walls. I have a lot of respect for these walls. But the professors here are preparing you for something. To work for somebody. About a year ago, I spoke, I met with one of the engineering professors, and I said, You really should have entrepreneurism taught in the engineering school. And he said, What would that look like? And I went through my curriculum for the semester. And when I got done, he said, Yeah, what could we do to make that more difficult? <laughs> I don't know. He said, Well, yeah, my students really want more. They want to do more math and more problem solving and more, it needs to be more challenging. What can we do? You haven't started a business, have you? We came to an agreement to disagree, one, and two, that I would come speak in the, in the engineering school. So he called me up and last January I went over and I spoke to the engineering students. And it was this very same speech. But Scott introduced me as an entrepreneur who's built and sold many businesses. I've never received a paycheck from somebody. By contrast, I was introduced in the engineering school, and they said, all of you great engineers, you guys have so many awesome ideas. Here's the man who can take them to market for you and make a business out of them. That was my intro. And I'm like, I got to change my speech. I came to teach these guys and gals how to start businesses. No, there were no women in the room. See, better to be in business, there's more women. <laughs> yeah, who is right. Ladies, you can do everything that a man can do in entrepreneurism. In fact, there are so many opportunities out there for women-owned businesses. You are in the right place. This is an awesome place to be. And if you desire to have a business and be a stay-at-home mom, that really works with entrepreneurism. It doesn't with a job. This is the right place to be. This affords you so many great opportunities, however you choose to go. All right, any other reasons why you want to be an entrepreneur? Yes, sir. Big impact. Money Grubber says big impact. OK? Helping people. <laughs> he saved himself, though. That was very strategic. That guy's smart. I can't pick on him anymore because he wants to make money to help people. <laughs> nice save. And we're going to speak about that today. OK, so I start every class with this right here. Now, let me ask you, tell me about the traits of an entrepreneur. You can throw them at me. What are some traits? First of all, you're extroverts, which means you're sharing. You're willing to talk. You're not afraid. You'll just throw things at me. Go. Fearless, love it. Exciting. What? Exciting. Exciting. Adaptive. Adaptive. Ambitious. Ambitious. Creative. Creative. Right. Taken. <laughs> okay, yes. Scrappy. scrappy. I love scrappy. Love Sir. Proactive. What? Proactive. Proactive, okay. 
Decisive, way back there. Stubborn. Stubborn. You know me. <laughs> Sir. Good at building the relationships. Good at building relationships. Self-motivated. Self you, know, you know who gets me out of, out of bed every day to go to work? You know where my time clock is that I punch into? Yeah, it doesn't exist. You had better be self-motivated if you want to be an entrepreneur. Nobody's getting us out of bed. I actually do very little grading in my class. I don't care if you don't read. I don't care if you don't turn things in. Because you see, if you really want to be an entrepreneur, you've got to do it yourself. Self-motivated is a great one. Thank you. Others? What? Risk taker. Uh huh. Anybody in here risk averse? Afraid of taking a risk? It's okay to say yes. Think about it. Yeah. You are? But we're not oh, how embarrassing. But we're not stupid risk takers. Okay, good. That's a really important distinction. We're risk takers. We're going to teach you to take smart risks. I like that. Okay, how many of you are afraid of risk? It's okay. Raise your hands. A, a small number. Okay, I think some of you are afraid to put your hand up and say, I'm afraid to take risks. <laughs> I played golf with the MBA school last semester, and a great young man came up to me and he said, Brother Church, I really want to be an entrepreneur. But he said, I am so afraid I'm going to fail. And I said, Jordan, dude, that's a given. There's a 100% chance you're going to fail. So don't worry about it, OK? But it's so true, we will fail. I've started, I don't know, I've never kept track, let's say 100 businesses. I've sold seven, but I've sold 100. Now, that's the old school way of doing it. I call it at-bats. I had a lot of at-bats, and I was bound to hit a couple doubles, a couple triples, and I hit one out of the park, okay? That is not the smart way to do it, and in ENT 101, I hate to keep plugging my class. It's really good, though. <laughs> I'll teach you how to do it smarter so that you don't have to start 100. You can start 10 and sell 7, OK? All right, so those attributes, outgoing, confident, they're passionate, they're observant, they're visionary, they're determined, they're good listeners, OK? Those of you in my class, you know we spend a lot of time on being good listeners. They're frugal, they're savers. They have a high risk tolerance, fearless, Heard somebody say, they question conventional wisdom. And this, we revisit the rules. I've spent my share of time in the principal's office here at Brigham Young University. Because my students broke the rules, I told them there are no rules on this assignment. And then I ended up in the principal's office. So I have added a few rules. But we question the rules. Today, I, we build a playlist in my class, and today, what was the name of that song? Be Still by the Killers. Be Still by the Killers was the one that we picked today for our class. And it was so cool because it talked about how everybody tells me, no, you can't do that, and that's not going to work. And you played one for me today, too, from uh, Sutton, Foster. Sutton Foster from Broadway. And it was Say Yes. Everybody tells us we can't do it. And as entrepreneurs, we love it. When somebody tells me, no, you can't, you better watch out. I'll steamroll you because you just gave me all the motivation I needed to go make it happen. If that sounds like you, you're in the right place. If it's not, it doesn't mean you're in the wrong place. But yeah, no motivates me, OK? All right, so here's our problem. 90% of startups fail. My average, seven, and I've started like 100, sold seven, started 100. So they didn't all the others fail. But look, that holds true even for me. And yet they let me speak to you. OK? So the problem here is the very attributes that make us successful as entrepreneurs are also the reasons that we fail. OK? Our passion to our vision. Our determination to succeed causes us to fail. If you're on the wrong road, 
but you won't get off it because you're too determined or you won't listen to other people. This is why failures occur, okay? My favorite book sits right next to your Book of Mormon, okay? <laughs> Nail it, then scale it. Who's read it? You guys read this for this class? Yes, sir. Say no mas, okay? Does that work? Say no mas? Okay, thanks. My Spanish translator. <clears throat> that book right there is what takes that 90% equation and flips it around. It takes you from a 90% failure rate to a 90% success rate if you'll follow the process of validation. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Okay, so these are the reasons, these are the traits that make us successful, but they're also the traits that make us fail. All right? Intellectual honesty, this goes to listening. A willingness to face up to the fact vigorously whether they prove us right or wrong. Okay? We often hear what we want to hear. And we listen selectively. If you will be completely honest with yourself, your chance for success will skyrocket. Okay? Got to hear what people are saying to you. All right. How many of you are savers? It's a lot of hands. All right, confession time. Let me draw the curtain. How many of you are spenders? Wow. You're in punching range and you confessed. All right, you're my victim. You're a spender. Okay. You love things. You get money, you spend your paycheck pretty quickly, pretty common. Yes and no. Yes and no. Okay, spenders, where are you? Okay, what's your passion? What do you spend on? Food, food is tasty and we do need it to live. Okay, do you like nice things, nice sunglasses, stuff like that? That too, okay, just like spending. Okay, it's cool, I'm gonna change you guys today, okay? Who's a saver? Okay, how much money you got saved? It's a good way to pick up chicks, inflated a little, yeah. 2,500, okay, how much you got saved? 11,000, okay. I love to get personal. Nothing's off limits with me, okay? So, I was at Thanksgiving dinner in 90, I know, dinosaurs roamed the earth, maybe 95 or 96. And my brother-in-law, he's sitting there at dinner talking about this business that he's gotten into. And it's a bottle of weight loss pills. It's called Metabolife. He had one skew. SKU means an item, a product, one product, on carts in malls. So he'd stack them as a pyramid, or he'd stack them as a box, or he'd space them apart. You couldn't get very creative when you have one SKU. But on this four foot wide by eight foot long cart in the mall, he would generate about 180 grand a month. Okay, a cart in a mall typically generates eight to 12,000 bucks. It's generating 18, 180 grand. And I sit at Thanksgiving and I just listen. He's kind of a turd, so I'm in awe. I like him a lot, but I'm like, really? And after dinner, I went home and I had one of my employees. I had a window and door company, okay? And I had one of my employees go upstairs and I said, I went to a library and checked out a book. You ever heard of that? We used to do that. And this book was called, it was a mall directory. There are 3,500 malls in the, in the country at the time. And I said, Taylor, I want you to call every single mall in the country. When they pick up their phone and say, Cottonwood Mall, I want you to say, do you have a Metabolife cart in your mall? If they say yes, say thank you and hang up. Well, be nice. If they say no, I want you to ask for a contract to be faxed to you. I want you to bring it to me, and I want to execute a contract immediately. After all that work, we opened 17 carts, very few of them in the same state. But over the next few years, we made millions of dollars off those carts. And then Metabolife decided to go to retail, which meant they were going to put our product in Walmart and Target and Walgreens and all of mass retail. You're taking our business away from us. We built it up for you. Well, 
They said, but we're going to pay you this handsome sum of money. So here I made all this money, and then they bought my business back away from me. Wow! It was an incredible opportunity. I'm not bragging. What I want to tell you, savers, I was able to jump on that opportunity because Kara and I managed an apartment complex, drove a Honda Accord that we paid two grand cash for, and we stockpiled everything we made. We were so proud that we never turned on our heater. It was really cold in our apartment. <laughs> but that's how frugal we were. And I will put 70% of why I'm standing in front of you today because we were savers. You need cash. In order to take advantage of opportunities, you need cash. Now, I teach a really interesting lesson on creating wealth. And if you want to come to it, I teach you how to create wealth. I don't have time to tell you about it today. But I teach it in my class on Monday and Wednesday of next week. It's the two days of the semester I teach it. Anybody's welcome to come join us from 2 to 3.15 right here in this room next Monday and Wednesday. And I'll teach you how to create wealth if, if you have saved. All right. Next, they is those who have saved have. Observant, this is a big one. And I harp on my students. I'm in a bishopric now of a YSA ward and I harp on them too because I walk around campus or wherever I go, I see people just sitting here doing this. I go to the movies and everybody's sitting on their phone before it starts. If you want to be an entrepreneur, this needs to be put away. Because ideas are not going to pop up on your screen. There might be one or two, but the chances of that, really slim. We lived in a world where we were looking out the windows all the time. We were seeing things happening. You guys aren't. So those devices are a huge blessing to you. You can search patents in a very small fraction of the time that I could when I was starting my businesses. But you got to take your heads up from those screens and you got to see what's going on around you. Okay? Put your phones away some of the time. Put your screens down. Pay attention because that's where opportunities are happening. And we're specifically looking for something. Maybe I'll come back to that in a minute. I'll come back to that in a minute. High risk tolerance, fearless, not afraid to fail. In my class, my wife teaches a marriage prep lesson. It's true. And the marriage prep lesson is interesting because you may not have an aversion to risk, but does your spouse. If you're dating somebody and you want to be an entrepreneur, you better be sure they don't have an aversion to risk, OK? I had a business partner, and we had a growing business. Things were really good. But for those of you who want to make money and have independence, there's a flip side to entrepreneurism. We sometimes work a lot of hours, and our paycheck goes like this. Sometimes we take a big paycheck, and sometimes there is no paycheck to be taken. His wife couldn't live with that. She said, the inconsistency is driving me crazy. I said, yeah, but you're seriously going to leave this? He says, yeah, I got it. Got to keep mama happy. OK, peace out. We went on to sell multiple businesses. My goals when I was sitting in these chairs, I wanted to be a millionaire by the time I was age 30. Maybe a flawed goal, but that's what it was, just being honest. I wanted to be retired by the time I was age 40. We reached those goals. The reason that I bring those two goals up with you is I haven't worked because I had to since I was in my 30s. But that friend of mine will work until he's in his late 60s. That's a benefit to being an entrepreneur. It doesn't happen for everybody. But it is a benefit for many entrepreneurs. And a reason why I would encourage you down this path is for the freedom that it can provide you. Now, you say freedom, and you're thinking freedom of work schedule and so forth. I teach entrepreneurism. I make exactly $0. It's great pay. Terrible boss. <laughs> <laughs> but I have the free easy. I have the freedom to do what I want. I'm 40, I can't remember, 49. 
And I have the freedom to do whatever I want. So I spend my days doing just that, whatever I want. Okay? All right, so this is very cool. I read an article a few years ago said, don't, said it was titled, Don't Send Your Kid to the Ivy League. This admissions counselor from Yale, used to be an admissions counselor at Yale, maybe Princeton, doesn't matter, Ivy League, he left and he now writes for the Dallas Morning News. And he writes this article and he says, in working for the admissions department, excuse me, all of these years, I've noticed a commonality amongst all of those students. They were raised from a very young age to attend an Ivy League school. And as such, their parents took them down a very narrow path that was completely free from all risk. They had all of the tutors they needed to be certain that they succeeded. They had the piano instructor or the cello instructor or whatever else, the horsey, equestrian thing, you know? They had everything they needed to stamp that application. And they started on it when they were a very young age. And so you know what their parents created? Employees! We need employees for our businesses. It's a fantastic thing. But the Ivy League regularly cranks out employees. I'm not knocking them. Those are very smart kids. But they are not willing to take a risk. So back to the MBA student. You have got to be willing to take a risk. Okay? Many of you, you come to school and you're thinking, I got to pay rent. I got to buy my books. I got to have money. I got to go get a job. You're driving down the street and you think, well, there's Arby's and it says, help wanted in the window. I'm going to go shave roast beef, okay? Don't do that. There are so many opportunities for you to make money doing your own thing. Before I got in big trouble, my first assignment of the semester before the ad drop deadline, I broke everybody in my room into 10 groups, or into groups of 10, and I gave them an envelope with seed capital in it. I gave them as much time as they wanted to plan their company that they were going to start. But from the moment they started making money, they had two hours on the clock. They had to stop the moment they hit 120 minutes. Then they opened their envelope to see what their seed capital was. It was the same for every team, 10 bucks. What are you going to do with 10 bucks? I had teams that generated over $1,200, starting with $10 in two hours. Okay, some really cool ideas. One team, they were six, seven, eight hundred bucks. They went up into the nice neighborhoods a little ways away from campus. They went door to door and they said, do you have a, uh, any item of designer clothing that we could have that you're not going to use, that you're going to take to DI? And the team split up and went door to door doing this. They met at the end of the block with a big pile of clothes. Beforehand, they'd gone to a consignment shop, said, this is what we're doing. Will you buy it from us at the end? I think they made 800 bucks in two hours. My point is, there are creative ways. I have so many students. In my class, I have students that run a detail shop. I have a student that runs, I forget. I have so many students that run their own businesses while in college. They have the freedom and flexibility to do whatever they want on their own time frame and they're not shaving roast beef, and they're not building Mr. Arby's dreams. Get my drift? Start thinking entrepreneurially right now. If you want to be an accountant, you need to wait till you graduate. If you want to be an engineer, you need to wait till you graduate. You want to be an entrepreneur? Start right now. Kara and I started our first business I had just returned from my mission. I was home two weeks. We were introduced to a window and door opportunity. We started a window and door business before we got married. We ran that business for 10 years before we sold it. But in that early days, we didn't make enough money that we could take any money out of the business. We were pumping everything back in 
to build it up. So we started a diamond business at BYU, okay? Loose, raw diamonds. We worked our way up until we found the guy that sold to the jewelry stores. And so I would peddle business cards around campus and I would sell diamonds to students at one third the price they were paying for them at a jewelry store. Dramatic savings, totally legit. They knew where my apartment was. They could hunt me down if I cheated them out of their little rock. We made $50,000 a year selling diamonds at BYU. We kept selling diamonds after we didn't need the money anymore because it was too easy. I worked maybe four hours a week, maybe six on a good week if I had two appointments. This is what I'm trying to encourage you, the thinking that I want you to have. I didn't get rich. I never would have. I never would have gotten rich on the window and door business. But it was a good opportunity to control my own fate. Okay? Where do ideas come from? Okay? This right here, this word right here is so important. You guys gone to sleep? No? We're good? Okay. I'm trying to be the energizer bunny up here. I naturally am, but I'm trying extra hard for you. No, no uh, food coma out there. Okay. When we hear this word as entrepreneurs, the word pain, we don't just blow it off. We don't just stay in that line or, or go with it. No. We say, wait a minute. I just heard the magic word. Is there any way I could monetize this? Could I solve that pain? Hmm. Matt Alexander, my hero. He's one or two years graduated now. He is an awesome, awesome entrepreneur. Matt came up with this idea. He walked in his bathroom and he flipped on the light and he said, ugh, at night. He's blinded by the light and said, I hate that. That's such a pain. That's such a pain. I was told to listen for the word pain. And so he said, there's got to be a better way. Instead of flipping on that light, what if I invented a mat that when I stepped on it in front of the toilet, it would light up? He ran that by some people and they said, yeah, that's really a genuinely stupid idea. <laughs> and so he was at dinner with his brother-in-law and his brother said, why don't you just put the light inside the toilet? And that's like, oh, how come I didn't think of that? So he created a light that he could put inside the toilet and he put a little motion detector on the side of the bowl. So now when you walk in the bathroom, the toilet bowl lights up with a very soft light and it changes colors. <laughs> Matt made millions of dollars selling a Luma bowl to Walmart, Target, everybody while he was sitting in those seats. He sold his business two years ago and now he's on to his next business. Mark my words, his next business he will sell for nine figures. My guess, that's $100 million. Save you some math and some figuring, count, counting zeros. It's simply brilliant. Nothing crazy here. He started a Luma Bowl in those seats. He met Kara and I at a basketball game. And he pulls this, he had in a piece of paper all these little parts. And he opens this piece of paper up so he wouldn't lose them. And he's like, yeah, see when you do this, you do this, and we're like, crazy. And I said, how did you learn that, YouTube? <laughs> you guys can do so much. Okay, so we are watching for the word pain, and I am out of time, so I'm going to haul. Okay, so very simply, my class saw this today, but pain, are we talking a vitamin, or are we talking a painkiller? Are we talking a mosquito bite, or are we talking a shark bite? Really quickly, we don't go to the emergency room when we get a mosquito bite, but when we get a shark bite, we sure hope we get to go to the emergency room, right? So we're looking for a shark bite. We're also looking for something that has a big enough audience. If you want a business while you're here in college, then I'm okay with you looking at the population of Brigham Young University students. But if you're talking about a real business, grown-up business, get away from BYU. Get away from the LDS community. Those populations are way too small. Think big and go faster, Corbin. Okay, here's a couple assignments for you. I'm going to tell you to do entrepreneur interviews. Anywhere you go, anytime. One of my students did an entrepreneur interview. I know you're in here somewhere. 
I saw you hiding amongst all those people. She did an entrepreneur interview. She had somebody over for Sunday dinner two weeks ago. He was an entrepreneur. This was with her family. And so she interviewed him, and he didn't know. He just got interviewed. She did it for an assignment in my class. But let me tell you, that's what I want you to do every opportunity you get. If you ever run into an entrepreneur, you can get three minutes or five minutes of his or her time, take it. Say, will you take a minute, Joe, and tell me about your business? How did you start it? Were you in that space before? What has been a challenge? If you were my age, what do you wish you knew? What would you do differently? Simple questions like that will earn so much respect from that individual to you. But if you will conduct an entrepreneur interview at every opportunity you get, your knowledge will skyrocket. Number two, it's actually number one and number two on the slides, but I want you to keep a journal. I want you to carry a small notebook with you. Maybe you keep it on your phone, but I just told you to put your phone away. So carry a small notebook. And I want you to write every idea in that notebook that you can. Uh, last week, I, I don't carry mine as often as I should. But last week, I was trying to find a way to market to students on campus. And it's so difficult to reach you guys. You can go to this, you can go to this person who has a lot of people on Facebook or, or other social media. You can go to this person. But to get all of you, it doesn't exist. If somebody could find a way to market to all of you, you'd make a lot of money. Because that doesn't exist today. Interesting. Ideas like that, whenever you have an epiphany, you write it down. Make yourself accountable to write down two things every day. Don't care what they are. You watch Shark Tank, you have an epiphany, write it down. You come to an entrepreneur lecture series, you have an epiphany, write it down. Write down two things every day. What this will do is it will train your brain to come up with ideas. We have to come up with ideas to start a business. Start training your brain to come up with ideas. This is a proven way. I sit down with students who will show me page after page after page of ideas. Some have been crossed out, some have been highlighted, some have been circled, and some have stars next to them. Say, so can I talk to you about these three? Have at it. I am so impressed when I see that kind of thinking. Okay? All right, in one minute or less. Entrepreneur interviews, validation. You guys know validation. You're going to learn it from Nail It, Then Scale It. Lessons for along the journey. I'm going to wrap up on this. It is OK to pursue wealth. A lot of people feel very uncomfortable when we talk about the pursuit of wealth as entrepreneurs. It is OK to pursue wealth. I gave you my goals. I was pursuing wealth. Not very proud of that today, but reality is that's what my goals were. I asked the question. Last time I spoke in this group, I said, is it OK to pursue wealth? Is wealth a bad thing? And a gentleman on the back row raised his hand, and he said, if you are a bad person, you can do more bad with more wealth. If you are a good person, you can do more good with wealth. That is the perfect answer. And so, to my friend's point, he slip out? He may have slipped out. I'll try to forgive him. <clears throat> money is needed. For those of us who are part of the LDS faith, money is needed to build our faith. It accelerates the pace. When you see a new building go up on campus, your tithing dollars didn't build that building. Private donor dollars built that building. BYU TV doesn't run on tithe dollars. It runs on private donor dollars. The list goes on and on and on. Don't get me wrong, tithing is super important and does amazing things. But it takes bigger dollars than that. And they're greatly needed. So pursuing wealth is OK. What I want you to take away from this today, it's what you do with your wealth once you obtain it that will define you. OK? I have a quote here. I don't have time for balance. Maybe I can tell you upstairs. Clayton Christensen, how will you measure your life? This is awesome, OK? Each day, work diligently to be happy in your career. Clayton Christensen was a Harvard professor. Have quality family life. Stay out of jail. 
The important thing I want you to take from this, never, never compromise your integrity for a buck. You will see it every day, everywhere, and you might say, well, they're doing it. I have to do it to compete. Wrong. We never compromise our integrity for a buck. Number one. Number two, most important thing I can leave you with today. I see entrepreneurs flushing their families down the drain all the time. It is not a talent limited to entrepreneurs. No success is worth failure in the home. David O. McKay. Ladies, gentlemen, there are work hours, there are family hours. You can stretch your work hours during times of sleep and whatever, but they don't stretch into your family hours. When you go home, you leave work behind. You go home, you be a good father, you be a good mother. We don't compromise or sacrifice our family for the gain of our business. Don't ever forget that one, okay? And there you go, give back. Cause marketing. Have something with your family that ties that back in. Lastly, know what your why is. Your why, for me, it's my family. Everything revolves around them, and that's the reason that I pursue my success. I'll do Q&A upstairs. Sorry to go a few minutes over. Thank you for having me today.